Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing extremely well. Really awesome, important day today. We're doing our series of interviews and today we're looking at the Eagle Dynamics P47 Thunderbolt that's coming to DCS. We're all super excited about it. And we've managed to get um, Nick Gray from Eagle Dynamics has very kindly given up his time to come and talk to us about it, which is great because people want to know about the, the modules that are coming out, especially us. So um, hello Nick and thank you very much for coming to see us. Yeah, hi guys. Uh, thanks for inviting me on. So what we do, Nick, is we go through, we've asked for questions and they've come from the viewers. We'll go through the questions and see what crops up. At the end, we usually have a kind of, if we have time, a free fire session where anyone can ask anything they want about the module. And that's it, really. So if it's OK with you, I'll just start cracking on with the questions and see how we get on. Okay. What we've got here is a sheet uh, that we put together based on just some general statistics and some pictures and whatnot. And I'm going to go straight to the first question. Question one, from conception to final implementation, how long does a module like the P47 take to develop and presumably release? That's relatively straightforward. It's about 10 to 12,000 man hours and, uh, and it's broken down into four or five big pieces so there's the external mod which in this particular case was done by one gentleman um, um, who's still working furiously on lots of details um, uh, the cockpit which is typically done by one or two in this case it was one guy and that took him about uh, nine man months and then there's a combination of the uh, electrical system, hydraulics, if there's pneumatics, which there aren't in this case, I don't think. Um, uh, and then uh, all of the engine, power plant, turbo, and so on. And that's two guys who are responsible for that. Then there's FM, flight model. And actually, there are two people involved uh, in that. The first guy does the, the computational flow dynamics analysis from the 3D model. Uh, and then we take, uh, uh, and then we take uh, all the flight data that we have from the manual, and we'll talk about that in more detail. I think there's a question uh, further down, but you know, twelve thousand man hours is pretty, is uh, is pretty realistic to early access. And then after that, you've got polishing and bits and bobs, and that on an aeroplane like this, obviously not for an F-18, but an aircraft like this, you're looking at an extra thousand. 1,200 man hours. Mordra. And that's actually really surprising. Just to give you an idea of if you've never looked at man hours before, how ridiculously long that is, even for a relatively simple plane. I'm just going to work it out. 60 hours a week I do on, G on GR times 52 weeks, that's right, per year, about 3,000 hours per year. So that is three, four times what I spend, that is an obscene amount of hours that goes into making these things. But, um, yeah, <laughs> it just puts it in perspective. Okay, very good. Let's crack on. Number two, as the technology progresses fast, what do you have now that was not available at the time you were working on the early modules? Is the process of creating a module easier now than a few years back? Uh, yes and no. Um, uh, yes, because now we've got some, you know, a team with some very good understandings, uh, some very good knowledge on, you know, what works, what doesn't work. And, um, you know, when it comes to FM, the first time we did the, you know, things like the Mustang and, you know, it was, it was very complicated and it was brand new and involved an incredible investment in figuring out how to make something which is as close as possible to the real thing. And from there, you have derivatives. Um, um, same with the engine systems. Once you've made a Merlin uh, power plant and the cooling system, even though in the case of the Spitfire, you've got maybe two or one, if it's Spitfire 5, but two coolers, two radiators, you know, one intercooler, um, you know, one oil cooler and so on. It, 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 you know, you can roll those things out uh, onto the Spitfire. Um, and it's and it's it, it's always you know easier. Every new aircraft is quicker, 
um, when it comes to understanding the systems and the, the parameters of uh, each system and how you need to tweak them to reflect reality. So you save a lot of time, each one is quicker. When it comes to cockpit um, and 3D model, that's a completely different story. You know, the level of detail, complexity, um, and subtlety, kinematics, you know, undercarriage, all the cinematics of the uh, uh, of the retraction, the hydraulics, and so on, the flaps, the way the flaps move, the way they insert themselves into the wing, all of that stuff we wouldn't have done 10 years ago. Now you've got to do it. And so there's a lot of, a lot of detail work that's expected from our customers, and rightly so, in order to, to have something visual, which is lovely. And the same thing with the cockpits now. I mean, the, the, the level of detail we're going to with uh, the P-47, it will be, I think, our best uh, Second World War cockpit. Um, and so that takes more time because it's just manual work. That you, there's, there's no corners you can really cut, right? Mm. So it's a yes and no. Roger, yeah, so what you mean. So there's more detail in these models now, but that means a lot more work. But So would that apply to, you were saying how you can uh, cut corners is the wrong word, but almost kind of reuse bits. Does that mean that things like the uh, F-18 and the F-16, you can kind of reuse the, the kind of targeting pod, for instance, information, and then use that on the other plane as well? Well, exactly. Exactly. I mean, uh, obviously, you've got you know, a lot of uh, small differences when it comes to uh, the rendering of the various uh, images in different aircraft and the you know, slightly different symbols positioned in a different environment and so on. So but the fundamentals of a targeting pod, um, you know, are the same. And so you're saving a lot of time um, uh, because there's a lot of commonality. Same, you know, you, if you do an AMRAM, well, that AMRAM's good mm. for for all airplanes, mm. right? Um, the radar is it's a similar sort of thing. You know, you do, um, you, you know, you're going to do an F-18 radar. It, believe it or not, it's quite similar to an F-16 radar, you know, um, and so on and so forth, depending on generational um, weapons. There's not a lot to change. It doesn't mean it's faster. It just means there's commonality. So you can just take that block and modify it in a, in a certain way, but you, you don't have to do it all again, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you save a lot of time with the more sophisticated aircraft. Um, you know the kind of money we're spending on doing, you know, the AIM one twenties right now is just phenomenal. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, because none of the true data is actually available, and we've had a lot of pressure from people to just get it right. And mm -hmm. I said, guys, you know, this conversation's over. We're going to do it absolutely from start to finish in the in in the correct fashion, which means wind tunnel testing, all angles of attack, fuel burn, um, seeker simulation, you know, the cat's pajamas. Um, and, and then, you know, once you've done it, that's it. Uh, you're good to go. And, and, and maybe there's a bit of tweaking over the years, you know, because you might get lucky and you might get an SME saying, actually, it doesn't really do quite that in terminal phase or the autopilot doesn't quite last that long or, you know, the batteries now we've given an upgrade to the Charlie model and you've got 120 seconds instead of 85 or whatever it may be. So, you know, we, but fundamentally, once you've got it, you're good. It's like how an intercooler works on a, on a P51 or a supercharger. Once you've modeled that, then you don't have to do it again. Roger, Roger. Um, now... Uh, I d desperately must um, uh, keep myself from asking further questions and going off on a tangent about AMRAMs and stuff like that. I know the whole internet's out there. <laughs> Ask him about the AMRAM. Ask him, but I'm not. I'm going to be good and I've got to stick on topic, uh, at least for very, now. Very good. Uh, right, excellent. Uh, three, what software do you use to make the models? Are there, are there anything you have problems with in that program? I guess it means like the 3D well, models. Yeah, it's uh, 3D Studio Max um, is the main modeling uh, software. And when we use things like uh, Substance Painter and other bits and bobs, and yeah, it, we've got a suite of, uh, of tools which are pretty standard uh, for all you know, in the industry. Um, I'm not personally a, uh, uh, a software modeler, 3D modeler, so I can't tell you. Uh, but um, people seem relatively satisfied with uh, with these products, and mainly because they've been around for a long time, you know, a bit like us, really. And mm. they started off being pretty clunky, but step by step, every 
you know, every iteration gets a little better. I mean, they all have ambitions to be fantastic with V1 and their dogs, and but by V10 and beyond, they're really lovely. It's, it's, it's the story of software, and it's our story as well. Yeah, Roger, everything is constantly improving. And it's good to see that the old uh, aircraft are getting reworked, like the, you know, the KF-50, the A-10C, uh, great planes, but obviously by now they're really showing their age, cockpits and whatnot. So it's nice that people are bothering to go back and rework all that stuff uh, to well, make it, it comparable. Yeah, I, I, you're 100% right. In fact, you know, um, the products like the A10C um, are, are are really interesting machines, right? Um, and, uh, you know, not to do it um right today and not to have a nice cockpit today it's uh it's just silly um okay it costs you one and a half man years to redo the cockpit and maybe another man year or two to redo the or improve the mess missiles and put you know the queuing system and whatnot so for the equivalent of maybe three and a half four man years uh which is what about eight thousand ten thousand you know you're going to uh probably treble your sales um, uh, from a, a, a point X to which was a steady burn, and you're literally going to treble it just by spending that money. Um, and it and it, it just looks nicer, you know. It's more pleasant, and you'll see with the new weathered A10C cockpit, which will be coming out pretty soon. It's uh, it's really really lovely. Mind you, that I think that's one. Th uh, I won't go off on a tangent again, but it's one thing that really doesn't come through from the gamer's point of view. You know, the guy who's flying it. That every time you need to go and do a change, like redoing a cockpit or something like that, to the layman, sounds like a rel relatively small thing. You know, move some textures here, move some polygons here. But from a business point of view, which is what ED is, it's a fully functioning business, obviously. To do something like that is hundreds of hundreds of hours. Each hour, you're paying your programmer. 30 pounds an hour or whatever, plus your overheads and stuff. The, the amount it costs a professional company to go in and actually do a bit of programming is phenomenal. Um, I think a lot of that get lo gets lost, but um, yeah. <laughs> anyway. it's, 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 it's a bang for buck thing uh, that we have to do. And, you know, um, there's a lot of things that go on under the bonnet which uh, don't make short-term money. Um, and don't make so short-term sense, uh, but are fundamental long-term, you know, like rewriting graphics engines, rewriting net code steadily. All of those things contribute, especially as, you know, complexity and size of missions, number of players, and so on go on. But then there's there's the front end, which is, you know, and I have to call it eye candy for no... Mm, uh, for, for, mm. for, but there's no better word for it. It really is eye candy. You sit in a lovely brand new A10 or a weathered A10 that's just got exactly the right 3D um, shape and feel and it, you know you're going to buy it because it feels important it feels valuable it feels as though you're you know you're not being you're not being abused you're 50 or 70 bucks or whatever it is it, you know it's worth it you own it and you're proud of it mm -hmm. yes when I do my I, I've, I do reviews for all of the modules trying to be as uh, unbiased as I can and it's, it's what I always come back to I always say if you're going to pay your $70 or whatever it costs it's got to look good however well it flies it's got to look good it's got to sound good you can't miss that out as well and it's got to do A, yeah. B and C well um, yeah yeah, absolutely okay anyway um, uh, we've got off track again for what was the reason behind picking the P47 well I mean you, you've been to see our outfit in Duxford Roger um, yeah, uh, we've had the pleasure, honor, and, and uh, in many times privilege of rebuilding and flying uh, about 95 different Second World War fighters uh, and bombers, actually, because we also rebuilt a B-17 and flew, operated a B-25, um, and we're rebuilding a, a, a bow fighter. And so it's not only single engine fighters, but so we... We've had this amazing in-depth experience, um, and we always wanted to make a Second World War, um, you know, fighter simulator. But we realized that the marketplace really is in mm. the high end, so we we couldn't go there fast. Um, we had to go there slowly in in little baby steps. 
Um, so, yeah, I mean, Cadillac of the Skies, the Mustang, it is pure Americana, probably one of the most beautiful pieces of machinery ever built by man. It's, a, you know, the 110-day magical machine. You know, it's, it's a fantastic aircraft, and anybody who's flown one, just knows that it was it it truly was one of the great weapons of the second world war along with the mosquito the spitfire the merlin engine I mean, these iconic machines and so we started with that and then and we had to go on to a bit of german stuff and whatnot then the spitfire of course as far as i'm concerned you know the mm. the next most iconic aircraft um, probably for me the most iconic mm. aircraft ever created by man um and a pure joy to fly um, and, you know, right behind that, believe it or not, is the Jug. I mean, the P-47, we owned um, uh, one for many, many years, and we rebuilt another one, which is a Razorback, so we know the aircraft intimately. It's a fantastic machine to fly. Um, you know, we met and knew very well a number of Second World War pilots, including Gabby Gabreski, who was, uh, who was a good friend of the fighter collection and came on three different occasions or two different occasions i apologize and then i met him in the u.s um to to duxford when they loved this aircraft um it, it did an incredibly good job especially down low and it, it 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 was the first escort fighter really um that that brought down the the incredible loss rates on b-17s to an attrition rate which was acceptable of course that was surpassed massively with the p-51 thereafter but it's an amazing machine and probably the easiest of fighters to fly believe it or not it's mm. an absolute pussycat wow okay it's um, it's good to hear. Uh, I've done a lot of interviews, and it's good. I can tell when someone's got you know genuine enthusiasm, or when they're just kind of doing a sales pitch, and you can tell clearly about the genuine enthusiasm uh, for this plane, which is great uh, from my point of view. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Okay, right. Are we going to get it as a complete full fidelity model, or is it going to be released in stages as early access and then updated? Yeah, I mean it will be. We always deliver the early access. I mean, many people criticize this early access model uh, and pre-sales model, but yeah. you know, frankly, it is the best um, way to go. And I've, I've voiced my opinion many times, well, not many times, but a few times on Hoggett. Hmm. I've just said, you know, gentlemen um, and ladies, there are a few of them, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, ladies and gentlemen, keep in mind that um, there is no way in God's earth that we would have sufficient QA capability mm -hmm. to deliver a, uh, a perfect product out of the box. It would cost us a fortune, and it would take forever. Um, and frankly, it would destroy the buzz and the participatory reality of doing early access products. Now, what does that mean? It means that we have seven internal QA staff today. We cannot get high-quality pilot-level, experienced gamer-level QA people in Russia and, 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 and you know, in, in Belarus and maybe Ukraine. We cannot get that quality um, that you'd expect. The guys we have are fabulous. But the bottom line is when you have a thousand people chiming in or 10,000 people chiming, mm -hmm. they are going to find the bugs in these things very, very fast. And they're going to make a lot of noise. It's going to be extremely negative. Everybody is going to be crying blue murder. But the bottom line is that's the way to get the best product quickly out of the door. If we were to do, for example, you know, uh, uh, an F-18 um, without early access. We just did a, a vague simulation. It would probably cost us between 150 and 200,000 man hours to do it perfect mm -hmm. if we did everything internal. And it would probably take six years with a massive staff. Mm. The way we've done it here is we're up to approximately 120,000 man hours and w it will be finished within three years. Um, so it's it's you know it's less um, investment. It means that the price is right, and people get to enjoy it and participate in it, frustrated as they may be. But actually, it becomes their product. 
because they've invested in it in the early days and they've contributed and it is part of the bonding relationship that we find and uh, you know it's frustrating but it gets there and it permits us also financially to keep the product in a in that sub 100 price point otherwise we'd be up in you know the 250 level for any of these really sophisticated aircraft it would be impossible okay. so same with the p47 having said that um, it will be in a much more advanced state with, we believe, many, many fewer um, gremlins than something like a, an F-18 or an F-16 or anything complex, shall we say. Moja, that's a really interesting description. I really wasn't expecting that. So what you're saying is that to release modules, especially the complex ones, the F-16, the F-18 uh, and so, to re release it in early, early access as we do and build it over the next following two years, that is the most efficient overall way of making it, right? That's, that's It's a the most efficient way by miles. Um, and, you know, we have many, many examples to compare. I won't use names, but, you know, some of our third-party mm -hmm. friends who delivered, and you'll sure. probably know who, yeah. a product which was more advanced than, um, than uh, in terms of bugs and features and so on. Well, he was three years late. Mm -hmm. um, and invested much, much more money, I think, than they were originally expecting. Mm -hmm. And that's just a reality. Um, you need third parties to, A, kick you along. It, 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 it creates a sense of urgency, which you also don't get if you're just sitting there doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a bit like this coronavirus story. There is a sense of urgency because it's out there. It's a problem. It's live. It's now. And it focuses the mind. You don't get that if you're just like poodling along, mm -hmm. ready to go. I mean, you know, uh, it's just reality. When Windows launches, you know, it, it comes out with 60,000 bugs. They, don't, they can't afford, mm -hmm. um, even with a 1,000 people in beta test team, in external beta test, a 1,000 people running their show. They, they just can't afford to release it totally bug-free. It it's just impossible. Because there are so many subcases, so many intimate, you know, combinations of screens and machines and, you know, drivers and this. It's just madness, you see. Mm -hmm. And so we run at any one time about 4,000 to 4,500 bugs on our Jira system. Um, and, uh, and we're squashing them as fast as we can. And we run them in this, you know, typical Jira prioritization fashion. Some of them stay on far too long, and, and we apologize for those. Um, but w we really face a, a, a barrage of things to handle in a, a sense of emergency, which we just simply wouldn't have. And hence, why it would cost more, why it would take longer, why you wouldn't get it out on time, and probably our business would die as a result. Mm. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you know what's interesting? We're, do we're doing a, a, a relatively small interview on a, you know, in the scheme of things, a relatively uh, small aeroplane. We're, we're already tackling the biggest uh, issues of the day, if you know what I mean. Some somehow we've already diverged to tackle the biggest issues between ED and, and the fan base there is. So I don't know how that happened, but good. Um, uh, for, for but me, I can help you with that if you wish and just put it in yeah. comparison with aviation itself. If you look at what happened in terms of the ambitions of the F-16, the F-15 when they, they came out and so on, and the, from the test aircraft, which was the demonstrator, which goes into winning a contract, to what they become 20 years down the road, mm -hmm. which were already pre-planned for the vast majority in the initial specifications, for the vast majority, the time and money and commitment there is no way on god's earth that all of that could be delivered from the get-go when it was put to senate for a budget approval mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and that's the reality in complex things unless you've got a monster budget I mean, i'm telling you monster budget of many tens of millions of venture capital out there which you can afford to burn freely without having customer feedback. And I just don't believe it in this very exclusive and niche sector. Yeah, Roger that. I mean, it's, it's good because it helps quote the idea, uh, which is uh, very, which is out there uh, among the fan base that uh, ED um, release stuff early, maybe even earlier than they should do, 
um, to just to get money early, just a you know a quick buck. Um, but it explains why that's not actually true, and um, I think that's interesting. And how it is just the best way, personally as well. I personally, and I, I understand I'm a bit weird. I actually like the whole thing being delivered early and being involved in you know. I mean, I have uh, I do a video like I just did one today saying, look, this isn't working. F16, this bit doesn't work. Two weeks later, Wags puts a video out. It's been fixed. It's great, and you, and you get to see that step by step. It's going to take two years or whatever, and by the end of it you know you nearly got the hornet done and fully working and you've had a little piece of the of the history so yeah i think it's good but you're right and we listen you know to people like you and the others and so on because mm. it matters you know if you're saying that this is crap this is not good enough this isn't or i really like that oh that's wonderful um that is invaluable feedback which you're pumping out to a hundred thousand users mm. and 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 they then try the product and they also have something to say and they give you feedback which we also pick up and it becomes a very virtuous circle and as i said earlier what's wonderful is that the people who develop it they read this stuff mm. they see it and they take it personally there's a real human being saying what they like and what they don't like and what pisses them off and what gives them pleasure mm -hmm. and that's the bottom line you know, um, you know, 50 million lines of code is Windows 10, right? 50 million lines of code. We are 5 million lines of code, 4.8 million lines of code, just to put it into perspective, all right? They have a, a thousand external tests, as I was saying. We need the community to give us that feedback. Otherwise, we would not be able to deliver anything like the quality where we hope we can deliver. So, anyway, there you go. Right. Well, hopefully it will generate some positivity out there. We'll, we'll see how it goes. But it's nice to have it explained anyway. So, that's great. That's really good. Okay, we'll push on, guys. Um, we're up to number six now. Will the P47 be released with the updated damage modeling that you are developing? And maybe just a little word about this uh, updated damage modeling. I haven't personally don't know anything about it. Okay, so what we decided some time ago, it's now a year and a half ago, believe it or not, um, when I started getting more involved in, in the daily operation of the company, and I said, look, you know, our damage modeling sucks balls. It's, it's not acceptable. Um, we've got to do something radical about this. And I talked to them about the experiences I've had in fighters, um, and, and, and they're complicated. You have, you know, hydraulic failures and you know, uh, pneumatic failures and this and that, and it goes on and on and on, and engine fires and constant speed units and all the stuff that I've experienced um, in civilian flying. And I said, what we need to do is to break an aircraft down into all of its bits, you know, uh, power plant, cooling, hydraulics, blah, blah, blah. You know, all of that stuff needs to be broken down into components. And we need to now simulate what can go wrong in every detail control system power plant propeller cooling and so on so that's why we decided to do it and it's a complex it's non-trivial um and well we're going to get there so the p47 hopefully will uh, it is being worked on but I cannot say that it will necessarily be there in a satisfactory state shall we say mm -hmm. in early access Roger. Okay. Yeah. I mean, great, great for us to. We do IL2 as well. And IL2 as a product overall, I've done the comparison. You know, it is inferior to DCS, but there are some great things you can take away from IL2. Damage modeling, especially visually, really is spectacular. Now, I've never been in a real Spitfire and shooting a real, I don't know, Mustang or uh, a Curveverse or something, but it just is very, very visually um, uh, splendid in IL2 compared to DCS and it really adds to satisfaction so it'd be great to I, I'm looking forward to comparing it anyway and um, and, uh, Brilliant. and seeing what we, oh, we love IL too I mean mm -hmm. they're friends of ours they do a fabulous job uh, and we're you know very envious of some of the mm -hmm. things they do but I am convinced uh, that uh, the end result uh, you'll be you'll be satisfied with good Watch this space. And because it's all guns kills as well, obviously, you can see each little bit. So anyway, mm. very good. Um, 
a seven. I mean, this is an interesting one. Obviously, as you can imagine, the first test that I'm going to do as soon as I get my greedy hands on it is shoot it, and because that was that's what it was known for, right? It was it was known for a, a 109 putting all of its ammo into it, and it was still fly. How tough will the P47 be? Will the cockpit armor be modelled? Yes, it will, of course. Um, you know, one twenty millimeter round from 109 in the right place, and you're dead. And let's make it clear. Mm. Um, so the quality of your shooting it determines you know the outcome even in a p47 it's a tough machine it's a great machine it's capable of taking enormous amount of uh, of damage and uh, and i think it'll be felt roger yeah uh, dip, just out of interest does anyone know if the 109 uh, cockpit armor is modeled do you know it's got that kind of wrap around hood thing anyone know if that actually does anything or if it's just visual um now, the wraparound hood in a 109, if you've ever been up to it, is flimsy as hell. Really? Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it didn't offer much protection at all. The, obviously, the forward frame was, uh, was good, but the wraparound hood it wasn't a great success story, put it that way. The 190 forward armor was superior, mm. apparently. Interesting. Okay, very good. Um, we're on eight. Considering the P-47 was also a ground attack aircraft, which is what I'm hoping to use it for, how are you going to deal with the damage model issues with the ground unit? A question mark. Bombs having to be direct hits, rockets being incredibly weak, etc. Okay, so as you've probably noticed, we're not a ground um, uh product mm. we're mm. going to go towards massive improvements we believe in the coming year or two um uh, uh, when it comes in particular to damage modeling of our ground units but i think we just need to focus on 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 things in steps it is out there it's a long-term objective to deliver much more credible um and we're getting simon pearson and a number of other experts to help us um, determine you know what are the weak points of different uh, a different armor um, what are the weak points of different uh, ground units but at this stage everything is pretty primitive roger gotcha okay yeah I'm out of interest we were doing a literally before we came on here we were doing tests can you can you take out tanks or armored vehicles with gbus laser guided very accurate bombs without the warhead armed and you can and um, something that the damage done to the tank varies upon the speed that you drop the bomb. So, uh, so it's not that bad. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's quite quite cool programming going on there. Anyway, um, uh, where are we? Nine. We know that the P forty seven was to inspire the A tens Thunderbolt two, named later on uh, as being a tough bird. I would imagine it must be capable of taking a fair bit of battle damage before going down. What is your view on this? Asking as a few birds are made of glass in DCS and often a single round can put them out of service. Same comment as I uh, said before. I mean, at the moment, our damage model is not good and it is going to improve and be much more balanced and I think more realistic um, you know, in the months ahead. And everybody will be able to judge and, and shout at me for being... Uh, um, for being uh, maybe over optimistic, but at least on paper and from what I'm seeing, I think uh, it will be much more realistic. The P47 will not be an exception. It's a tougher aeroplane to shoot down than a P51 any day. If a round hits anything to do with liquids on a on a P51, you basically got an aeroplane in mm. distress. Um, not the case in an air cooled engine. So mm. you know. It's going to be pretty obvious stuff, but a twenty millimeter in in a in a P forty seven main spar is going to have slightly less damage than in a P fifty one main spar. That's for sure. Roger. So when we're talking about them outside of DCS at the moment in the real world, what is it? Do you know what is it? What are the things that make this more durable? To, to enemy fire because I'm looking at the pictures and nothing there's nothing obvious there's no big shield around the back of the pilot or nothing you know massively obvious there's nothing is it the the toughness is it the, the airframe they made it bigger and bulkier and heavier is it is that the kind of thing that made this airframe so durable yeah uh, you, you spot on I mean if you add metal 
to anything, um, it becomes more difficult to break. Uh, simple as that. You know, you basically, you've got a 2,200 horsepower engine, military rated, mm. not with water injection. Mm. You can put that up to, you know, to higher power outputs. But basically, it's a 2,200 horsepower engine, very reliable, very heavy aircraft, very overbuilt, big airframe, big spa, big attachment points. You know, everything's big. And so you've got to imagine that in the end, what's going into it is the same size as what's going into a Spitfire, which is half the weight mm -hmm. of a P-47. And the bottom line is that, you know, one's a very flimsy tin can in comparison and the other's a beast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, as we're doubling the weight and it's going to be more or less roughly the same size, it's not going to be dogfighting a Spitfire, presumably. <laughs> Well, no. I mean, a Spitfire is king of the hill in in dogfight terms. You know, I've never lost uh, air combat in a Spitfire in a turning fight. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, unkillable. An absolutely supreme airplane, and the Mark 14 was totally king of the hill. But the P47, you know, has its thing. You know, it's it's actually initially if the, if the first pull gives you very good performance. It gives you a lot of um, uh, you know, you can pull a lot of G if you're zooming along. And so your rate of turn is good. Uh, it's got a very big wing. It's a very safe wing as well. I used to do some incredibly weird things, especially mm. before they put the horizontal uh, vertical strake on the top of the fuselage going to the fin. It had some very unusual characteristics. But apart from that, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a lovely airplane to fly. Just don't get too enthusiastic mm. Um um, and slow, you get slow, you're dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, it's, so it's going to be more suited for boom and zoom, presumably, like a Focke Wolf one ninety or something like that. Definitely. Mm, okay, it's interesting what you were saying there about the the Spitfire. I mean, even the Mark, what have we got? Mark nine in DCS. We're doing yeah. at the moment our biggest warbird campaign we've ever done. Four months of solid warbirds every Monday. Well, uh, is when we actually do the flight. Um, and the guys finally are getting, because we're doing this every week, we're actually getting really good at flying our warbirds. None of us, as you know, none of us are professional pilots, none of us are trained. We just, we just like flying. Uh, and it's nice to see that through just uh, having to fly good to survive in these really hard battles that we're doing, um, people are really learning to use their planes properly because survival matters. And you see the, the uh, Spitfires are now becoming absolute king of the dogfight. The guys are learning how to get in, I don't know what it is, 6G or something, uh, turn, and nothing can keep up with them. And they're learning to use that when they're in trouble, for instance, to become essentially immortal. Um, yeah. I, just, I just find it really interesting that the guys are learning this, even if maybe they don't know, you know, they, they're not the kind of guys that sit and study it in a book. They're just doing it by trial and error. I found it really interesting. Oh, brilliant. Um, right, let's pop along. Uh, 10, how does the flight model compare to, say, the P-47 from other sims like IL-2 and FSX? I don't know if you can answer that, but any thoughts? Well, I can't. Um, you know, uh, I, all I can say is this. Um, having flown many, many, many Second World War fighters, um, I am not satisfied personally until the aircraft comes to what I can say is acceptably comparable performance look and, and feel, right? Mm. If it's not very close, then it's just not coming out of the door. Um, and that's unique. Um, a lot of people say, well, I prefer this, and IL-2 does that. And All I can say is I can't criticize anybody else's flight models. It's not my business. I'm only interested in our stuff being as close as possible to reality, full stop. And that's the same with the F-18, the F-16, and so on. Uh, same with the Mirage. All of those aircraft ha go into the hands, having gone through CFD computational flow dun uh, dynamics and detailed flight modeling uh, at, at grassroots. Then it goes to the SMEs, such as myself and others for hardcore stuff such as F-18, then it goes to them for all of the special things which you don't see in CFD, which are more quirks of aeroplanes or, you know, the special parts of the flight model which aren't described by polar graphs and so on. Mm. So all I can say is it will be um, as close as we can to the real thing.
Roger. Uh, now I'm the opposite way around. I'm supposed to criticize people's uh, models, so that's what I do. Um, now I don't do FSX, but I do do IL2. IL2, great game, great fun. We're doing it tonight, if you like a bit of fun. Now the problem is, the reason why we much prefer DTS over IL2 uh, for the Warbirds is that DTS has a uh, a feel to it. You can feel the weight of the aircraft. You can feel the Spitfire is light. You can feel the P-51 is, is relatively heavy. You can feel the Fokker Wolf is relatively heavy. How is that done in terms of ones and zeros? No idea. I don't care. It's not really my problem. But it's there and I can feel it. In IL-2, uh, I'm going to get myself in a bit of trouble, but you can't feel the weight of the plane. Um, that's why we consider it more gamey. Uh, so for me, the most important thing in terms of its characteristics is that it carries on that DCS trend like the planes have described of being able to feel big and heavy because as it should do um that would be my uh, uh 50 cents for what it's worth in that well it's worth much more than 50 cents i can tell you <laughs> um people listen and it's a fact if it if it doesn't feel right it's probably not right um having said that it's a different market it's a different it, it's a different thing altogether. They have a world-class product, lovely team, lovely people. We know them well. And, and there's a space for all of us, um, to be honest. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a place for pretty pictures and there's a place for hardcore. Um, our objective has always been to, to be more of a simulator, which has um, fun components mm. to it because you get to know it well you get to know the realities of an airplane well and you get to know the the things which you can do and in, in this aircraft versus that aircraft and learn the tactics and and genuinely you have fun because you, you you're becoming an expert and it's the expertise in the product which keeps people coming back i think Imagine. which may be very difficult to start but hopefully it's a bit stickier. Yeah, I'd say that's hit the nail on the head completely. We could go and do IL2 and we could do a lot. We could do a lot more and we could look a lot more professional in IL2 because it's easy. We can go as you even... Oh, God. Again, don't want really to get myself in trouble. We can go and fly perfect formation in various mixed planes in, 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 in Warbirds, in IL2. Great. Uh, we come and um, do it in DTS and we look like a bunch of idiots. Because it's much harder, much more dynamic. Have you seen? You've seen you're trying to take off and stuff. Much harder. However, we don't. We want the hardest. We want it as hard as possible because the reward, the gratification that comes, self gratification that comes at the end of having completed a mission when you know it's really hard and probably really realistic. We'll never know really, but uh, probably really realistic outweighs that of the immediate gain of uh, making things easier. Um, so. Uh, Anyway, well, we, then we have the same belief. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and it's not just us, obviously. It's all the other tens of thousands of people out there. Um, right. Uh, which plane currently in DTS would you say this would be most similar to? I'm assuming you're going to say an A8, but um, what would you recommend? Probably. I mean, air-cooled, obviously. A8 is much smaller mm. than the P-47. It's a much more compact, lighter aircraft. It's nim more nimble in that sense. Um, yeah, it's going to be uh, it, uh, you know, out there on its own. Um, it's a big American Cadillac. It's a proper machine for for big guys who smoke big cigars. Mm. It's a it's a it's a it's a man's machine, no doubt about it. It's it's different, and you'll love it. Cool. Yes. Well, obviously, we're looking forward. Um, the P forty seven had an excellent roll rate and energy saving dive and and zoom climbs from high altitude. Is this something to expect in a DCS module when it comes out? Definitely. I mean, everybody says, "Yeah, I mean, you know, the you know the the P forty seven is heavy, and therefore it dives really fast, and so on." But actually, believe it or not, I mean, it's a slippery thing going downhill. Mm. Don't get me wrong, but you rapidly get into mac maximum, you know, Mach number, and it, and and the aircraft isn't very nice when you get into that high, those high Mach numbers. You know, anything which starts creeping beyond point six two, point six four. And, and, you know, you start getting compressibility issues, mm. and that's why they install dive brakes in it. Mm. Totally different from, for example, a Spitfire, mm. which is incredible. Um, it, 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 this is an airplane which stalls at, you know, 60 knots or something like that. And yet, in a dive, 
it wants to go faster and faster. It's 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 really it's spectacular. It, it kind of cuts through butter in a dive. When we go past 320 knots, it just wants to go faster. Now, the P-47 is heavy, and so gravity is doing its thing. But the way the wing is, the shape of the wing, the fact it's relatively fat wing in comparison with a Spitfire, and the position of the tail and so on mean that actually you can get yourself into trouble, and, and many um, pilots did. So, yeah, you can expect it to be good to a certain speed in a dive, but then that's it. You know, you've got to... Roger, uh, one thing that stood out for me is that the guy said, excellent roll rate. Why on earth would something this big, with this big wings, have an excellent roll rate? Has it got special ailerons or something? No, um, it's an elliptical wing. Um, it, it's, it's, the wing is relatively thin at the extremities in comparison with the, um, uh, uh, the attachment points. It's a very nice design. It's not, it's not an excellent roll rate. It just feels very nice mm. it's it's a lovely roll rate it just feels great it's a bit like a p40 you know people just lovely roll rates feels smooth whereas you take a clip wing spit it's like whoa it's like an aerobatic airplane you know it's that's really good roll rate clip wing spit that's a proper roll rate um double in fact uh p47 roger okay um 13 is it to come with the Curtis paddle blade propeller as it did with in in later in the war? Uh, if possible, you best quickly explain what that means um, from the question. Yeah, um, there are two key manufacturers of um, uh, of uh, propellers. There was the Hamstandard uh, um, hydraulic uh, uh, constant speed unit prop, and there's the Curtis electric prop which is the one we have installed and yes it's it, it feels like a paddle blade it's a, i can't remember the exact version of this one it's got a shorter cuff blade than slightly later versions but it's it's the curtis electric prop which is nice i mean i love curtis electric they're good props they have one big negative curtis electric props is the electric system because if you lose your electric for whatever reason now you're in a fixed pitch prop aircraft mm, roger Okay. Um, 14. This is quite a big thing for me, actually, because I'm a bit of a dummy and I struggle with stuff like this. But I've heard energy, engine management is very difficult in the P-47. How much of a learning curve can the average DCS player expect? Uh, yeah, it is tricky. Um, engine management is a big deal. I mean, I often look and see how people use the throttle, you know, forward and back and so on and so forth. I mean... If you read the manual on a P-47 and you retard the throttle under the recommended mm. um, uh, uh, manifold pressure uh, levels, you're, you're going to underboost the engine. And, and, and you do that three or four times and you're going to ruin the engine. Mm -hmm. You're going to get – because, you know, the, now all of a sudden you've got the – the speed of the airplane going through the air is driving the propeller. The propeller becomes, it, it's actually driving the engine, you see. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when that happens, you get all kinds of master bearing issues and you, you will get engine failure. And it's the same way if you over boost an engine, that means, you know, you're, for example, at 2200 RPM and you open the manifold pressure to 45 inches, you, you will blow the engine. It's just a reality. So engine management in Second World War fighters is the real deal. If you do not pay attention to it, you will lose your engine. Now, what's simulated today in terms of the way the propeller stops instantaneously and so on and so forth is absolute rubbish. Mm. It's not correct. But what's going on under the hood in terms of you know, the, the, um, the, the, the mathematics of, uh, uh, of oil temperature increase, Therefore, of um, uh, uh, coolant temperature increase, the uh, oil pressure decrease, and therefore the 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 the, the, the uh, you know incorrect lubrication of master bearings and sleeves and so on. All of that is there. The fact that the prop stops clang instead of <laughs> winding down Hollywood slowly. Style, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's absolute rubbish. But we, um, but what's going on underneath is true and is correct. Roger, and that's one thing. Quite often, people 
think uh, when they go and buy their first warbird or try the, the one that's free um, they often think oh wow this is going to be so much simpler to fly than a uh, an f-18 or something like that and in terms of obviously weapons and stuff it is but um, as I found out to my detriment uh, still uh, happening is how complicated these engines are to keep going at different altitudes different speeds different throttles different rpms it's yeah to keep these things in the air is an absolute nightmare which is good because that's what we want um but yeah yeah oh the modern modern aircraft are a, a, a piece of piss yeah. i mean you leave know, it forward leave it backwards the... <laughs> that's it oh <laughs> uh, very much so i mean you know i flew the the sukhoi 27 with anatoly Quachur in 1995 and did the whole routine having never flown a Sukhoi 27 <laughs> in my life, including tail slide and Cobra and everything. Um, and he asked me how many, time, you know, how, much, how many hours I had in this class of fighter, and I said, one. <laughs> um, which is the, was the truth. I'd flown a MiG-29. Uh, and it, they're so easy in comparison. They're totally carefree. Yeah. I mean, there are fighters which are much more complex, especially the early ones, you know, the Century Series fighters mm -hmm. uh, and, and so on. But, um, you know, uh, the late generation, fourth generation, obviously the fifth generation fighters are totally carefree. It's all about delivering weapons. Mondra, okay. Well, I am absolutely resisting the urge to talk about that so we are moving downwards uh we've got number 15 which variant of the p47 will we be getting oh it's 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 a d model basically and it's um i can't remember off the top of my head but uh, uh it's a late model Modrum. um on to 16 similar to how we have different versions of the p51 d25 d30 Will we see different models of the P-47 going forward? D-22 Razorback, perhaps? Oh, I really hope so. We rebuilt a Snafu uh, in Duxford, which is a, a D-22 Razorback version, absolutely no backwards. Beautiful, beautiful machines. Um, in many ways, it was our first choice, but... Anyway, the bubble canopy offers a bit more freedom in combat, and we figured let's just go with the bubble canopy. Roger. Just be that of interest. So, yes. Does anyone know the, the difference? I've looked and struggled and tried to f find a difference between the two P51D variants we've got. Do, do you what yeah. professional answer is it? It's very little. It's Roger. antennas and bits and bobs. You know, it, it's, 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 it's nothing. It's peanuts. Roger. Okay, very good. Uh, right, 17. Have you used real pilot evaluation of G-THUN, whatever that is, to ensure the flight model is realistic? And how difficult is for your team to obtain sufficient data on the fighter to work with when creating the module? Well, um, G-THUN used to belong to us. It was called No Guts, No Glory, and we had it in the fighter collection for my lord 20 something years so we know the airplane intimately and i flew it as well mm -hmm. so yes is the answer to the first question um finding the drawings the factory drawings for the p47 was a night mm. it took us a year and a half to get them out of the smithsonian institute mm. and we got the whole thing you know, there, there's just nothing out there. Anybody looking on the internet to try and find drawings of the P-47 will find nothing. We got the lot. Why are they so hard to get hold of? I thought they would have been all over the internet. Because surely there's nothing classified because, there. Because, no, it's, it's, a good, it's a good point. Because um, the um, Long Island Republic factory basically shut down and everything was shit canned. Mm. There was nothing left, nothing kept, nothing at all. And it just disappeared. Um, and there's only one set of copies, a uh, full set of copies, which um, reside in the Smithsonian, to our knowledge. And we have very good friends there. We knew the director general uh, for many years and so on. And we managed to get them out, uh, as I said, after a year and a half of begging and you know going there and whatnot. So... We've got the full drawings. Very good. How can you recreate the engine sounds under different loads and rev range? Yeah, um, every year we have um, uh, 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 our guy Constantine and Dima go to Duxford 
Mm -hmm. And during Flying Legends, they attach uh, high-quality microphones to uh, the pilot in cockpit. And, um, and also, um, they record all the startup, taxi, takeoff, and so on, and fly-by sequences. And then we sample all of that and put it into our sound engine, which is a, is a moving feast, as you may notice. Mm -hmm. We're permanently improving mm -hmm our sound model and i think you'll seen the recent 109 improvements mm -hmm. i think are fantastic mm -hmm. um and hopefully in the p47 they'll be pretty good i'm not very happy right now with the external sound i have to say it's not right mm -hmm. so we, we might have to do some tuning uh sadly flying legends isn't going to happen this mm. year uh for all the reasons we know and we're going to mm -hmm. announce that on friday tomorrow which is very sad for me after more you know something like 30 mm -hmm. years of doing flying legends but there we go Modra. and just an anecdote from me uh two years ago at flying legends i remember i i think it was a spitfire of, of some variant it was starting up and yeah, when one of these planes starts up right next to you it's loud definitely loud smoky fire you know nasty business and everyone was kind of moving away including myself and you, i think one of your long-haired russians i forget which which chap it was was so interested in capturing you know it starting up he just kind of walked into the exhaust basically with his microphone i found the i think that's how they get the sound they just literally that's start the plane it. up get a really really good mic and just sit there with it so uh, absolutely really interesting. so you remember that's uh, yeah. that's that's a dima yo yo right you okay Okay, very good. Yes, awesome. Okay. Um, right, uh, on to 19. We, uh, will we get a good assortment of liveries to use, e.g. different US squadrons, RAF, USSR, maybe even Chinese? Uh, um, no, we'll have four, I think, um, at early access. Um, it, we're not really a liveries company, mm. as you may have noticed. Um, uh, we, we love getting all our friends from the internet to help us mm. do that why um number one it also bonds our users to the product um, but it's also a massive cost saving thing for us um, we only have so many artists available mm. um and and we've just got to keep them going on core things we just have to keep focused so we'll, there'll be four um and hopefully more down the road Roger. And I have to say, those amateur artists who sit and make all these thousands of liveries for these various things are absolutely amazing. I mean, they're most of them as good at you know quality as the ED ones. And doing it and doing it for free, I mean, I couldn't do it ever. <laughs> it's just amazing what they do. Well, that's right. And I think that's the community thing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we can keep the pricing where we're at. And, you know, you have to keep in mind, I'm not taking a salary out of this mm -hmm. thing or taking a single dime. All the money goes back into it. This is a passion. It's a bit mm -hmm. like, you know, the fighter collection. We don't do it for profit. We do mm -hmm. it because you love this, you know, this business. And we love mm -hmm. aircraft, aviation, fighters, you know, the real stuff for gentlemen. Mm -hmm. um, and... And so everybody else who's in it are partners of ours in that sense. They're the community, you know, they're the custodians, if you wish, of the product in reality. Uh, we're just the little hands behind who, who get it to stage X. And then the rep, the, you know, a stage Y comes from them, you know. It's, mm -hmm. uh, and Z, ultimately, we might come back with something later. But it's, it's, it really is a community product. And, and that's why I love it. Mm. Here, here. Okay, uh, 20. What can we expect of initial loadouts for the jug? Uh, well, obviously the uh, 50 cal mm -hmm. uh, four aside with 350 rounds a gun, mm -hmm. 2,800 rounds, uh, 500 pound bombs, and we're hoping to get the, the rockets uh, as well uh, uh, on early access. Otherwise, it'll be coming right behind, you know, a week or two after. Roger, is it this aircraft that has the rockets coming out of those giant launcher tubes, or am I thinking of a different Yeah. Thing? Yeah, mm. yeah, they're, they're sort of a, a threesome mm. wrap of tubes. Yeah, it's pretty efficient, actually. It's a, quite a successful package. Mm. Roger. Okay, uh, 21. Similar to something like IL-2, could there maybe be some advanced armament options in the future, like removal of four of the 50 cows and some extra performance, like some squadrons did during the war? I must admit, that is a cool thing with the um, IL-2. You can change an engine for a different engine. You can add mirrors and stuff like that. It's quite cool. Um, yeah, I mean, it's funny that some squadrons 
uh, and they and it, it was often squadron bosses. They just had a thing about mirrors. You saw that on Mustang. Mm-hmm. Some guys mm-hmm. put in two mirrors and one and this, and some had internal mirrors. Others had on one stalk or two stalks and uh, and and stuff of that nature. Uh, yes, why not? Um, once again, it, it's 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 less hardcore but i think that what's going to happen as our community gets bigger is the demand for it for those little things i call them cosmetics um are going to be appealing and we might just do that in fact it would be interesting to know Mm. although it's very difficult to get a really broad set of answers it's always interesting to know what people really want Mm. because the most vocal people on the internet are often the people who don't necessarily represent everybody <laughs> so sometimes we go down the wrong track but anyway yes maybe Roger resisting urge to comment um, right 22 uh, oh yeah well this one's always going to come up can you give us a release date to the nearest month at this stage May oh that was easy it's next month cool mm-hmm. perfect right okay I'm going to get my um, I'll get my tutorial playlist all set up and ready for it then. <laughs> Very good. Okay, uh, 23. How soon after the P47 could we expect the release of the Mosquito, uh, which everyone's getting excited for, for obvious reasons, keep up the superb work? Uh, I mean, the Mosquito is fantastic. I mean, we had uh, uh, FB6 Mosquito, which we did a deal with the Imperial Museum, and we were going to rebuild it internally, right? It's a lovely aircraft. I mean, it is truly a wonderful, wonderful machine. I never got to fly it, unfortunately. We never got to rebuild it because the CAA were giving us problems in the UK because we had to do a special wing splice, and they just we just, just couldn't get it approved, so we sold it to Paul Allen in uh, Microsoft fame, and he mm. rebuilt it, and it's flying. a fantastic airplane, and our good friend Steve Hinton uh, was the test pilot, probably the most experienced Warbird pilot in the world by a long way, and he loves it. I mean, it's a great machine, very exciting. So, before we can release uh, the, the Mosquito, we've got to get Steve Hinton in our simulator telling us what's right, wrong, indifferent, needs change, not change, not so bad, you know. And that's hopefully going to be, depending on all of our travel restrictions and so on and so forth it's going to be late autumn i imagine roger very good okay 24 maybe someday a p38 which is another twin boomed aircraft isn't it uh would be a nice complement to the p47 both were uh, designated for the same function one of the greatest world war ii pilots ever flew the p38 lieutenant colonel bong Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I can't remember how many kill- kills, but it was something like 48 kills or something like that. You know, somebody mm-hmm. smarter will be able to tell me. Mm-hmm. Um, in mainly the Pacific theater. Didn't do so well in Europe. And one of the reasons it was it was slow. What was good about it is you could fly for hours and hours and hours over the Pacific and with, you know, big drop tanks and so on and you know, the twin engines over water. I mean, it's great stuff, right? But once again, that airplane also is not fast at all. Um, rubbish in a dive. Had terrible compressibility mm-hmm. problems over the tail. And so, you know, great machine. We had two. We lost one years ago. Um, crashed in Duxford, actually killing its pilot. My um, Our chief pilot at the time, uh, Huff Proudford, who, who's uh, one of my instructors on fighters. Great, great guy. Uh, it's a difficult airplane. Complicated aircraft important iconic aircraft and i think we'll do it one day roger lovely i think it's great that we're getting so much attention to world war ii um well we're certain i know a lot of people aren't a lot of people want their modern fighters and stuff and only the modern fighters but we think it's great anyway we really enjoy it uh right uh 25 given that we are going to soon have a modern day marianas map which i'm that's probably gonna be my favorite are there any plans for a world war ii version of the map hmm Yes. Hmm. So what does that mean, changing infrastructure of airfields and towns? Oh, yeah. I mean, as you can imagine, when the Americans took over, um, you know, the Marianas, it mm. became mini America mm. with, you know, uh, dunking donuts and things like that. It was very, very different in when the Japanese, um, you know, let's call it the, 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 the 41, 42 era, uh, and when they actually started building infrastructure, there in 43 44 and 
it was it was a jungle. You know, you got dirt tracks, PSP, you know, steel plate runways, this, that, and the other. It was pretty, pretty limited infrastructure. So it's going to be a lot of green, mm. <laughs> put it that way, but pretty, yeah. So are we saying that we get a modern version and a historical version of the Marianas? I haven't quite... That's followed. what I want. Right, okay, very good. Cool. Um, 26, are there plans to add World War II carrier operation to the simulator? Oh, hope so. Uh, we have the Corsair on the horizon, and World War II carrier operations would be a great addition. Yeah, I mean, the Corsair actually wasn't a great carrier aircraft, as you probably know. It's actually very dodgy undercarriage and weird mm -hmm. seating positions on horrible, not, not great to land. Um, you know, when you compare it to the excellent airplanes like the Hellcat and so on, which is one of my favorite airplanes, the Grumman Hellcat, mm -hmm. amazing machine. I mean, best kill ratio of any fighter in the history of air combat, You 19 to 1 kill ratio. Mm -hmm. I mean, a beast of a machine. Absolutely adored it. Very good carrier aircraft. There will come a time uh, where we have to do it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and I'd love to do it. Just for the thrill of landing, you know, on uh, one of those tiny decks. My lord, what a ride. Mm -hmm. Just Can't tell you when, but yeah, it's one of our dreams. My, my claim to fame, the Corsair. Um, everyone seems, on the internet anyway, seems to think that the Corsair is amazing. And they always say how amazing and how much of a game changer it's, it's, it's going to be. And I, I always used to think that until I had the pleasure of uh, your dad, actually, uh, gave me a two-hour lecture on, on the Corsair uh, a couple of years ago, <laughs> looking at it and saying, this was wrong, this was wrong, this didn't work, this was slow, that was crap. Um, and I have to hold my yeah. tongue now not to correct people every time they, 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 they say it's the best thing ever made. But, yeah, I found it really interesting. Well, yeah. But, you know, the Corsair is a beautiful piece of engineering. Very complicated, mm. actually, that whole gull wing mm -hmm. thingy. Um, it's the only airplane I've ever flown where you have the impression you're sitting on a hawk. Hmm. It's so weird. It's got this massive long nose and and you're sitting on you're not sitting in it and you're yeah. so high up it's very 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 weird i mean it was just it's a fast airplane for its era and it and, and it did and it had an amazing history as ground attack aircraft um but yeah i mean it, it's got all kinds of problems but it is an iconic machine it's Baba black sheep happy boington it's you know bougaville it's all of that stuff you know of legends and and it, and it did great stuff after the war, you know, going into Indochina and whatnot. But, yeah, it's definitely not. If you were to go into a proper fight against, um, against somebody, I mean, you know, Spitfire or Mustang can mm -hmm. eat it up for mm -hmm. breakfast. There's just no discussion. But it's iconic. It's beautiful, especially the FG-1D version, albeit it's got, un, it's got wooden ailerons. So, you know, max deflection mm -hmm. is forbidden at high speed because you just delaminate the ailerons. But it was a, it's, a, it's, it's a classic. You've got to have it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, right, 27. Could we expect to see any late war British aircraft, Typhoon slash Tempest? Well, Typhoon wasn't so late, of course. You know, it was, um, it, you know, but Tempest... I like the Tempest. The Typhoon was uh, did a great job. You know, fat wing, very stable rockets. You know, shooting stuff on the ground in early forties, no problem. The Tempest is very, very much later on in the war. Um, nobody's actually, who I know, flown any of those things. Mm. So I'd be a little bit uncomfortable, mm -hmm. you know, hand on heart saying, you know, this is the real deal, guys. Um, so I'm not sure. Maybe the Tempest, because it's so similar in terms of aerodynamics to the Sea Fury, and there's a lot of reports on it. And, you know, I, I remember speaking to Winkle Brown about it a oh, lot. Wow. And, oh, oh wow. yeah, he was a good friend of ours. How about that? <laughs> a hit, absolute hero. And Roly Beaumont, by the way, who was our safety pilot for 10 years mm -hmm. of the fighter collection. And of course, he was a hero in Typhoons and Tempests, and, you know, chief test pilot there, Hawkers, an incredible guy. Um, so the Tempest, I think we could do it honestly. Um, obviously, the engine is a complete nightmare. The Napier Saber 24, you know, mm. sleeve valve engine, heavens above. I don't know really mm. how we would do that. So we might do 
uh, you know, the, the, the Tempest 2 with the Centaurus engine four blade? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know is the answer. The answer is maybe. There we go. More jump. Okay, we've got a maybe. 28. Are there more ground assets in the work for the World War II asset pack to give us a more varied target list? We use the asset pack now. We love it because of the, uh, the flak. The flak is gorgeous. 88. Yeah, I mean... It's so weird. I mean, it's it's one of the least profitable parts of our mm -hmm. business, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. because it's just ages and just so much work to do good good stuff, and we sell it. But um, basically, you know, it's it's a very cheap thing to do. But each mm -hmm. model costs between for a simple thing between five to fifteen thousand dollars each one, mm -hmm. right? Um, and sometimes more. You know, a really nice tank will cost a fortune. So. It, it's not a money maker, but it's an important thing if you have ambitions to become something serious in Second World mm -hmm. War. So we have to do it. We're going to do it. We've got good stuff coming down the tracks right now. I think you'll enjoy it. It'll be released soon in the next few weeks, if not sooner. Um, and we've got also people like Simon Pearson on board who are bonkers about that kind of hardware mm -hmm. and it. more knowledgeable than any elephant I've ever met. So mm -hmm. we're going to have plenty of experts to give us a hand and also select the top 10 we'll do it in top 10 waves if you wish here here's our top 10 and now the next top 10 and blah 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 oh, roger yeah i mean from my point of view it's great because uh it, it makes a great you know i'm all about making videos and um it, nothing makes a better a better video than just an 88 really high modeled flat cannon battering away at a spitfire um, you know, it's, it's just really, and it's all it's modelled really modernly as well. You go back to some of the ground units for modern stuff. Some of those models are I don't know, ten, fifteen years old, low polygons and whatnot. This is all top notch and all looks awesome. So yeah, good. yeah. Um, okay, uh, twenty nine. Uh, looks like we're getting off topic a bit, but how do you monitor the DCS community's wants, expectations, criticisms, and does this information? affect your work and to what extent S someone i seem out. to have lost you guys right, uh, comms check i'm in right i'm going to do this one again question 29 someone snuck it in here how do you monitor the dcs community's wants expectations criticisms and how does this information affect your work and to what extent Brilliant question. Probably the most important. You know, as I said earlier, community is our business. It is why we do things. Uh, we really appreciate all of the community's, you know, comments, reactions, um, pleas, and complaints. Mm -hmm. um, I personally uh, go to most of the. I don't go to our forum. I get Matt Wagner and other people to go to our forum. I look at the complicated forums like Hoggett and so on. Um, not for, um, you know, not for more than two to four hours a week. What I'm looking for is patterns. Mm. What I'm looking for is to understand, you know, genuine um, uh, improvement opportunities where you can have very good value for money. I know there's a lot of people who are, um, you know, slagging us off. Our code is spaghetti code and so on. So, you know, of course it is. You know, we're an ongoing thing. We haven't thrown... The, the baby away with the bathwater, and I challenge anybody to start doing what we do from scratch without fifty million dollars in their pocket at least. We can't, you can't do that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's impossible. Um, so we 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 do suffer from that, and it does show. I mean, you know, uh, and and people get very frustrated. And, and and my objective as the founder of the company, and I don't really think that there's any other thing that I can do, is to try and mitigate people's expectations with a sense of realism and to balance it and to where I can make promises I will and where I can't I try and just say look we apologize we'll do our best to improve but honestly there's there, there are limits mm -hmm. hardware limits um, money limits time you name it so community is very important I really enjoy reading I really enjoyed as well when you know there's a there's a thorny subject like the F16 and we got absolutely mm -hmm. slaughtered for it. But you know it, it's it's tough. It, it puts us in a corner. Uh, it puts us in a difficult place. But we just have to climb out of it. You know, it's mm -hmm. like anything which is challenging. It's our job to climb out of it and and, and do better. So 
as I said, it's, it's part of our business model to have that feedback and that level of uh, interaction with our community. So uh, I, I welcome it. I, I, I approve of it absolutely. I think there's a lot of toxic people out there, but the vast majority are gentlemen and uh, very polite, very kind. There's the odd nut case, and, you know, but that's life, right? Um, and, and frankly, I, I understand, you know, sometimes it's very, very frustrating and, and people take it personally. Mm -hmm. And frankly, if they didn't take it personally, I think we'd have a problem. You know, if mm -hmm. the community went quiet, um, we'd be out of a business. Yeah, exactly. It means, uh, it usually means people are very vocal about something in general. It usually means they care about it because if they didn't care, they would just go off and do something else. Yeah, we'd be dropped like a hot potato and that's it. it would, the, the music would stop. Roger. Okay, that's got to the end. Excellent. Uh, what are your uh, time restrict? We usually open up for a few kind of um, just the guys to ask any questions. How long have we got you for? That's the question. Maximum 15 minutes um, because I have a uh, Skype call with uh, Matt Wagner, mm -hmm. uh, Sasha Pichinka, the boss of the um, upcoming secret project F16, F18 and so on. And Katya, so I have to I have to join that conversation. Roger. I call him Super Wanks nowadays, so I try and wind him up. I do it very well. <laughs> As you probably noticed, <laughs> constantly groveling to him. World class individual, <laughs> I may add. Absolute uh, we, superstar. We, we love our wanks. Absolute superstar. Yeah. Um, okay, guys, so you've, you've listened to that. Uh, that was probably our best one so far, so I'm chuffed about that. And uh, I love it how we, we delved into things other than the P47 as well. Any questions from my guys uh, that you've got for Nick trying to stick at least roughly on topic? They'll go quiet at this so, point. I noticed right early on in the interview when you were talking about the A10, you mentioned some of the possibly upcoming things that are coming to it, and you mentioned the queuing system. Mm -hmm. Is that something, because I've not heard anything about that yet, is, is that public domain at the moment? Uh, that's a very interesting question. No, it is not public that's domain. Why I, However, uh, that's why I raised it. <laughs> yeah, no, it is not public domain, but we know from discussions because you know we're operating in the 355th um, training squadron the a10s and other squadrons as well so we know what is open for discussion and what is not and we are going to do something which is um it's not itar uh, restricted but will be good enough for to be honest and we won't break any rules from from the noobs' perspective, is is this an air to ground system we're talking about? I don't know yeah. what it is. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's basically you look somewhere and mm. you acquire stuff, and you can you know you can you, you can essentially designate with your uh, with mm. your uh, helmet queuing, queuing system. Okay, that sounds mm. pretty cool, actually. That's wonderful. Yeah. Fantastic piece of kit. Okay. Um, any other questions, guys? Scaredy cats. Okay, <laughs> but we've gone we've gone a lot further than I thought we would. And I think that's absolutely excellent, Nick. And uh, I know how busy you are, obviously, of all the things you do. So thank you very much for giving us time. I would obviously love to have you back at some point for the hind, um, because uh, obviously that's uh, going to excite a lot of people as well. Um, so we'll see, I guess. Uh, anything you've got? Uh, I can't think of anything else to say. Basically, my mind's gone blank. Anything you've got to say, Nick? Obviously, it's, you know, a lot of people are watching. It's quite a good platform. Um, to oh, whatever. yeah. I, I'll, I'll tell you what I'd like to say about Grim Reapers. Now, oh, here it comes. We've, in trouble. Yeah, uh, it, it, and it's only good. You know, I've had the pleasure of looking at all your videos and I comment every now and again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've come from nothing mm -hmm. to being a serious bunch of players mm -hmm. um, with incredible know-how and, um, and very generous with your time. And I know that Simon was one of your um, most vocal and uh, 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 when I say vocal, I mean positive friends in the early days. Mm -hmm. And, and you've done an incredible job. So I want to congratulate you, your expertise, your team, and the productivity of your stuff is just out, is outstanding. So anyway, um, I'd like to thank you, the community, and uh, uh, and uh, yeah, long may it last. Long may it last, indeed. Yep, we're all we're all having a good time. That's good. Okay, thank you very much, Nick. Um, I'm turning the camera off now, and thanks everyone for watching.